Hell on earth in Syria. Russia's daily truce put to the test as hundreds of thousands of people remain trapped in a rebel-held enclave outside Damascus. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Eastern Kuta. When the UN Security Council voted unanimously in favor of a 30-day ceasefire, it should have brought relief to those suffering in Syria, but it didn't. Within hours of that vote, the Syrian regime continued bombing eastern Ghouta. And once again, Bashar al-Assad's forces have been accused of using chemical weapons. Syria's allies said they would abide by the ceasefire, except in eastern Ghouta, because they say it's under the control of terrorists. The rebel-held enclave was meant to be a de-escalation zone, but the last two weeks have seen some of the worst violence since the conflict began. Now, Russia has stepped in to play peacemaker by calling for a daily humanitarian pause in fighting of five hours. But is that enough to save those trapped in the besieged district? Natalie Pohonen has more. For five hours a day, none of this is meant to happen in eastern Ghouta. Because Russia has ordered a truce. But outside of those hours, the rules of engagement don't seem to apply in this part of Syria. The truce is meant to provide a humanitarian corridor, giving civilians the chance to leave. Their home has been described as hell on earth and a slaughterhouse by the UN. At least 500 people living here have been killed in just over a week. In recent days, rebels have accused the regime of using chemical weapons. Russia has in turn accused the rebels of carrying out the attack. But it's the civilians in eastern Ghouta who are suffering the most. Their villages have become an important battleground just outside Damascus, which the regime has been trying to reclaim. Their neighborhoods now in the firing line. The despair and the horror on the ground led to the UN Security Council demanding the siege be lifted immediately and a 30-day ceasefire across the country. But that won't apply to the fight against terrorist groups affiliated with Jabhat Fatah al-Sham. Russia says there's a chance the Security Council's plan may work, but it's not yet a done deal. Of principle. In principle, yes, there are chances provided all the forces on the ground in Syria, all those supporting them, including the supporters outside Syria, who patronize them. All of them will adhere to the requirements of the UN Security Council. And I remind all parties of their absolute obligation and international humanitarian and human rights law to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure at all times. And similarly, efforts to combat terrorism do not supersede these obligations. Syrians have been here before. The UN once described Aleppo as a synonym for hell. In late 2016, the regime laid siege to the city as it fought to retake it from rebels. Thousands of civilians fled after months of fighting. About 400,000 people are still living in eastern Ghouta. But how much longer can they survive living in this new circle of hell? Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this further, I'm joined now from Boston by Yasser Tabara. He's a founding member of the opposition Syrian National Council and a senior fellow at the Omran Center for Strategic Studies. In Baghdad, we have Mark Kimmett. He is a retired U.S. Army Brigadier General and completing our panel from Moscow is Sergei Markov. He's a member, former member of the Russian Parliament and director of the Institute of Political Studies. Thanks all so much for joining us. Yasser, Russia believes at least that it is in a sense protecting civilians uh, from extremist groups like Jaish al-Islam working out of Eastern Ghouta. Why do you believe that's a farce? Because uh, the total number of, uh, uh, of uh, extremists uh, that belong to Al-Qaeda or that are affiliated with Al-Qaeda 
uh, as we uh, have accurate information from the ground, is literally 398 members. Uh, there are about a thousand total, if you count their family members, uh, their, their wives, their children, etc. Um, we're talking about an area of 97 kilometers square, square kilometer that has 400,000 civilians that has been targeted uh, on a daily basis by tens of rockets and missiles uh, via the Russian Air Force and the Syrian regime heavy artillery and uh, with a, an average of 81 civilians uh, dead every, killed every single day. We're talking about uh, the indiscriminate targeting of hospitals, uh, about every single hospital within that 97 uh, uh, square kilometer area has been deliberately targeted. We're talking about local councils, we're talking about administrative units. Uh, the indiscriminate targeting, as we have uh, 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 as we have observed it and have recorded it through the Omran Center website, there is a very clear map as to which areas within the eastern Ghouta um, uh, area ha have been uh, specifically targeted, and you'll see that the areas that have uh, extremists in them. Um, are uh, basically take the least amount of brunt in terms of the, of the, of the targeting. What the Russians and the Syrian uh, regime are trying to do is not fight terrorists. They are trying to exterminate uh, this entire area, this entire pocket of resistance, just like they did in western Ghouta, in Daraya in the past, just like they did in East Aleppo in the past. Um, what they're trying to do is basically uh, have a campaign of forced uh, uh, cleansing of anyone who disagrees with the central government, whether they are a civilian, an armed group, uh, a, a child that goes to a school, uh, you know, an old man that's uh, you know waiting in line to to get uh, his daily uh, bread in a bakery. Okay, that's what's that's that's what's going on in Ruta. We're hearing now that from Yasser that behind the mask of attacking legitimate targets like al-Qaeda affiliated groups, Russia and the regime can also target legitimate resistance groups illegally and against the ceasefire. Uh, as already mentioned, of course, Damascus uh, would be interesting uh, to uh, include uh, peaceful opposition to the uh, future peace uh, coalition government. Uh, and Damascus will be happy if uh, this coalition worked in Eastern Ghouta. But it uh, didn't work. We know that uh, uh, Damascus had been uh, shelled from the Eastern Ghouta every day during those uh, uh, months. And finally, after the Syrian government uh, has uh, uh, three troops, uh, which they can, took them from the Idlib uh, area uh, after some agreement uh, with uh, Turkey. Uh, they started its uh, uh, offensive operation in Eastern Ghouta. I think uh, this situation in Eastern Ghouta will be finished in the few uh, weeks as it has been happened in Aleppo. Let me turn to Mark Kimmett joining us from Baghdad. I mean. What do you make of Russia's claims that it actually is interested in protecting civilians, even in eastern Ghouta, from terrorist groups? Uh, well, I think it is just foolish if the Russians are suggesting that their actions are in any way protecting the civilians while they are carpet bombing eastern Ghouta. On the other hand, the Syrian resistance is not without blame. They are intentionally using human shields in that area and civilian casualties for the simple purpose of raising the telegenic suffering that's going on. There's a very simple solution. We've seen it in the past in history, and that's to declare Eastern Ghouta an open city. They could easily allow uh, military forces inside to make sure that they don't uh, affect the civilians, but I, for some reason, I don't know why they choose not to do that. Nonetheless, the majority of blame goes to the Russians. They, are, they, are, they should be ashamed of themselves. They should be taken to the International Criminal Court. They and the Syrian regime that they are propping up are daily committing war crimes, which are against any norms of civilized behavior. And for that, they should be condemned. Okay, yeah, so I, I can see you disagreed. 
I'll let you say your piece there. Well, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I don't know where the claim that uh, some of these groups are using uh, uh, humans or uh, uh, civilians as, as human shields. In fact, actually, we are in, in direct contact with uh, the local councils that are, have been administering these, these areas for the past five years, uh, really, which, I mean, it, 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 it is uh, important to mention that this area has, has been the subject of fierce, uh, a fierce siege by the uh, Syrian regime for the past at least five years. Um, those uh, local councils and those who are responsible to administer the affairs of these people have uh, issued a, a number of, of highly cooperative statements, um, especially after the UN resolution, the Security Council resolution that came out a few days ago, um, uh, in, in basically support of uh, implementing uh, as much as, as possible of that, of that, of that resolution. Uh, they have uh, c come up with a number of mechanisms to monitor uh, any violations that take place uh, uh, of that of that Security Council resolution, they're very cogniz uh, uh, co co cognizant of the fact that they need to be on their absolute best behavior. The other thing that I need to uh, address is what uh, your guest from Moscow was 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 uh, alluding to earlier in terms of shelling uh, of these of these groups into Damascus uh, as a as a retaliation or response to the carpet bombing campaign that has been taking place of Eastern Ruta. Um, all, I, all I say here is that uh, statistically, if we compare the amount of casualties on, on either side, you'll see an incredibly uh, uh, desperate, uh, uh, not even subject to comparison. We have uh, three or four reported uh, casualties on, on the side of, of Damascus uh, uh, versus more than 500 civilians. Uh, killed in the most brutal of ways just in the past few weeks uh, within, within this 97-kilometer enclave that has been subject to, to brutal siege over the past five years, as I mentioned. Okay, Sergei, I believe you've been able to at least hear uh, the exchange, even though we seem to have lost, and we, it seems we've lost your, uh, your video connection once again. So, um, uh, Yasser, I just have to ask you that this, though, and this is on, on behalf of Russia's position here. Are you scared that what you feel are the horrors of the Assad regime could actually fall to something even worse in the form of extremist groups like Jaish al-Islam that Russia says it wants to protect people from? Uh, Jaish al-Islam has issued a number of statements that, uh, that basically shows that they're, that they're cooperating fully with the uh, international community uh, in terms of what is to be done on, 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 in eastern Ruta. In fact, uh, yeah, so are you they sure you're not actually being are holding naive? 100... These are groups that are affiliated with al-Qaeda. Jaish al-Islam is not affiliated with al-Qaeda. Okay, fact, and actually, and I'm, I'm not... I, I we think can argue the case. Probably... Jabhat al-Nusra is there, Hayat Tahrir I mean, al-Sham is there. Well, of course, and, and there is a, an ongoing war between these, these factions. Jaysh al-Islam, Faylaq al-Rahman are in, in, in ongoing uh, wars with Hayat Tahrir al-Sham and with Al-Qaeda, with Al-Nusra factions. In fact, actually, Jaysh, uh, you know, sources say that Jaysh al-Islam is holding more than 100 uh, 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 of the, of the uh, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, HTS uh, members uh, in response uh, to the continuous call to actually clear. And this is in response to civilian still demands. Known to be a uh, by, by, group by the local of councils, by, by the locals. Well, I mean, they are. I mean, we can we can get into the classifications, but Jaysh al-Islam is not classified uh, by by the United Nations or by by the international community at large as as a uh, as a, an extremist group, ala al Qaeda or ala Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. They, uh, in, in terms of their ideology, in terms of, I, I'm not a spokesperson on their behalf whatsoever. I'm someone who has been in, in, in known to be in support of the pro-democracy civilian uh, type of movement. We support a number of local councils on the grounds. Uh, you, you know, so that, that's a disclaimer that needs to be made. But uh, for those who know the uh, political and the military map of Syria, uh, they'll know that there, there are classifications of factions on the ground. And Jaysh al-Islam has been actually, uh, is the, the, the faction, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that actually clarified the entire era or cleared the entire era from Daesh 
a few years back, and it has been on, in, in constant struggle with Al Qaeda and Nusra, Tahrir Sham, to clear that area under very, very uh, uh, intense popular demand of the civilians in that area to 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 clear them from them because okay. people know that uh, the, these these elements are being used as as proxies to carpet bomb these areas because the 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 the, the, the civilians do not agree ideologically with with with, with, with these okay. elements and that is what Jish al Islam and Faylakh Rahman have been resp responding to over the past few years. Okay, Mark Kimmett, I saw you trying to interject. Go ahead. Well, no, I just <clears throat> I just find this whole argument back and forth. I do agree with the point that where the Russians will call everybody terrorists, there are legitimate resistance groups, pro-democracy groups inside these cities. Uh, nonetheless, uh, I take a look at the historical record of Rome. I see what happened in Paris during World War, World War II, when both those cities were declared not only by the international community, but by the antagonists in the fight. Uh, open cities so they wouldn't experience the type of violence, destruction, and collateral damage against civilians uh, that we are now seeing in eastern Ghouta. Uh, it's clear that these resistance forces and the extremist groups are trying to use that city as an enclave, as a sanctuary, as a safe haven, so they can continue to fight their fight. But at some point, the ideology should take second place to the human suffering that we're seeing inside that city. Okay. Yeah. You know, first of all, I think it's a joke when somebody called Jaysh islami or Harar al-Sham or Jabhat al-Nusra as pro-democratic forces. You know, pro-democratic people don't... I, I did not They're say not that. saying they're pro-democratic. I, I, I did not say that. Through I did the not say that. Or and I made a distinction uh, between Jaysh al Islam and Hayat Tahrir Sham. I made a very important distinction yeah, between Hayat Tahrir Sham, Al Qaeda, and Jaysh al Islam. So the you, Russians don't see that distinction because sorry, they have totally an agenda within sorry. that area. Or you will allow to somebody another to talk as well. I know the, 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 the distinction between Jaysh al Islam and Akhrar al Sham and Jabhat al Nusra. But I want to say that a lot of real soldiers on the ground, they keep flags of the Jafkat Anusa and Jaysh ul Islami and Akhrar uh, Sham in one bag behind of the um, uh, back uh, with them. They can show any flags which they need at uh, any moment. And again, uh, all those who are pro-democratic, they're sitting in Facebook or another social networks and uh, fighting by words. Usually, pro-democratic uh, uh, people doesn't run through the desert with Kalashnikov and don't uh, kill each other. You know, please recognize that there are no pro-democratic forces in all this civil war. And the problem for us, it's not to find some propagandistic idea as you are doing to claim some of the jihadists as pro-democratic, but to trying to move all this not absolutely non-democratic political force to the situation of civil war, to the situation of the, some kind of cold peace inside Syria and step by step to the uh, real peace. For doing this, please stop hateful terrorists. Will, for example, Okay, but why it helps? Uh, but we understand that this why it helps. It's a um, it joint pro a project of the British intelligence service. Uh, and uh, but Sergey, uh, I, I just have to ask you: Can the Syrian regime do absolutely no wrong in Russia's eyes? Again, we're seeing the regime accused of chemical attacks, and yet you say you have proof to show that these rebel groups are actually behind the chemical warfare, yet you've come forth, R Russia has come forth with nothing. Again, can the regime do no wrong? Are you only right? Are you only working for democratic forces in Syria? Can you really claim that? No, I cannot claim this. And of course, government of Bashar Assad is not ideal government. And of course, they also violating uh, human rights. And they also, before the civil war, it was no uh, democracy in uh, Syria. 
but you know it's it's usual in politics it's usually we don't have, we don't have choice between good and bad we have the choice between different uh, colors of bad uh, things and when we look at the Syria we could see that Bashar Assad because he is more moderate than Jafet Nusra, than Daesh, than uh, Jeshu Islami, than uh, Akhara Rasha. And because look at the ethnical and religious groups. Okay. Mostly they like Bashar Assad. And those whom uh, uh, minorities like, usually they are more moderate okay. politicians. Mark Kimmett, I will let you finish. I mean, is this just... I despair in saying that the only interest being fought for in Syria is just to perhaps maintain the lesser of all true evils. Well, I, I don't even see it this way. At, at, at this point, uh, I think the world understands what's going on, and the Russians should be strongly condemned for it. There may be a small cancer inside of Syria, the same cancer that the United States is going after in northern Syria. But the Russian solution, which is to take that small mole and chop off two arms, two legs, and the head to cure that cancer, is not the right solution. And for that, the Russian government should be condemned. I'd like to thank all three of our panelists so much for joining us. Still to come on the Newsmakers, Brazil puts troops on its streets to combat crime. But should the military be the one to restore law and order in Rio? And Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte warns of war unless Muslims are given more autonomy in Mindanao. Rio de Janeiro is known as Brazil's marvelous city. But Rio's current security challenges betray that image as gang violence reaches new heights, shootings, robberies and kidnappings have become the new norm. President Michel Temer has taken the drastic step of giving the military full control of the city's security. It's the first such intervention since the country's military dictatorship fell in 1985. And it's a decision that's divided public opinion. While the level of violence has become almost unbearable, some warn the decision could actually lead to further abuses. For more, here's Annalise Borges. Rio de Janeiro, Brazil's symbol of joyful days, has also come to embody the country's saddest statistics. Violence claimed nearly 7,000 lives in Rio last year. That's 18 people killed every day. Kidnappings, lootings and armed robbery have become the norm. It got so bad, authorities had no other choice but to admit defeat. O crime organizado quase tomou conta do estado do Rio de Janeiro. Por isso, acabamos de decretar, neste momento, a intervenção federal na área da segurança pública do Rio de Janeiro. The last time Brazil's military took over, it lasted 21 years. Hundreds of people disappeared and many others were tortured to death. Now some in the country fear a possible repeat of the human rights violations of the past. Não resolve o problema da segurança, muito pelo contrário. Essa intervenção vai matar pretos, pobres, favelados. The economic downturn hit Brazil in more ways than one. Recession widened inequality and proved fatal to public services such as security. That, combined with state mismanagement, meant Rio police officers ran out of money to repair equipment or put fuel in their cars. 
and that laid bare the frailties afflicting Cariocas, as Rio residents are known, as well as the rest of Brazilians, who have seen the presence of the state dwindle. For some, the military intervention is a desperate last attempt by the government to prove it can still run the country in an election year. Utiliza essa intervenção no Rio de Janeiro, que é uma medida exclusivamente política para romper mais uma vez a Constituição. A medida não visa a segurança. Não há um plano apresentado. Não há um projeto claro. Há um projeto de criminalização total da população das periferias, das favelas, das vilas, a população pobre do Rio de Janeiro. There's no quick fix to Rio's and Brazil's security problems. It will likely take more than soldiers' boots on the ground to restore order and, above all, people's trust. And a government with a dismal 2% approval rating may have a hard time delivering significant change. Annelise Borges, The Newsmakers. Joining me now in the studio is Ambassador Paulo Roberto França. He is Brazil's Consul General in Istanbul. Joining us from Rio de Janeiro is Jurema Vernek. She is the Executive Director of Amnesty International Brazil. And also from Rio, Eric Omena de Mello. He is an analyst and researcher specializing in Brazilian affairs. Thanks all so much for speaking to us. Ambassador, let me begin with you. Was there no other way to do this? Was there no other way to bring security to the city other than bringing in the military. It's a pleasure to be with you here. Uh, the situation in Rio was uh, almost at, at, at collapse point. Mm -hmm. The governor of Rio uh, made a statement saying that he was not able to hand the public security of the city and he asked for assistance. The numbers of violence in Rio have increased uh, scarily. Uh, just to give you, you an idea, in 2008, more than 23, 24 policemen have been dead, have been killed. In 20, 2015, more than 40 have been killed. And this was increasing in the last right. years. At the same time, uh, the situation of, of killings and the uh, insecurity of the population, the honest citizens, was at the border of, as I said, collapse. Okay. People were feeling uh, this sense of uh, lack of security, lack of safety. And of course, the government had to interfere, had to intervene, and has intervened in a partial way. Okay. It's a federal intervention, and it's aimed exclusively at uh, security. Okay, Jurema, there were no other options but to get the military yes. involved. Is that true? Of course it was. Uh, we, we, we do need to, to have more options. And we need the, the, an explanation from the federal government and also from state government why they are not uh, applying for these other options. They announced last year a national plan, national se public security plan that we didn't see in reality. They didn't use it as a tool for for changes, produce changes in the public security. And I don't, we don't understand why they are uh, applying for this extreme and inadequate measure that is the federal intervention. Yes, it's true that the people here are in fear. It's true that public security situation is really uh, bad. But it's also true that the federal government and the state government, they, they have the tools for deal with it in a daily basis, not applying for an extreme and in 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 inadequate measure. Okay. Eric, let me ask you if you believe the extraordinary circumstances in Rio justify these extraordinary measures of this military intervention, and whether or not, what will be the price that civilians are paying in Rio? Yeah, good question. I think, uh, first of all, are these circumstances really that exceptional? Because uh, the data about violence in Brazil shows that actually Rio is just the tenth most violent uh, place, uh, state actually, in, in Brazil compared to the other uh, 27 states. So uh, we have, uh, for instance, 
places like Sergipe, Rio Grande do Norte, Alagoas, Pará, many others that uh, the federal government is not even thinking of intervening. Uh, so this is a very uh, strange situation where not even close to the most being the most violent state is being intervened by the federal state. Uh, but you also ask about the civilian um, a price, you know. Uh, these are areas that are going to be under intervention. Uh, the, these areas are favelas, basically, in Rio. Uh, that's where most of the uh, local uh, drug gangs are. But the fact is, uh, there are also lots of people living there. Uh, and these people, they have nothing to do with the drug gangs. And they are the vast majority of uh, the population of the areas. And uh, they, they don't, uh, they are not feeling safe about this. We had uh, other uh, previous um, experiences like that, other interventions. Mm -hmm. So uh, the military was sent to the, to the favelas like Maré and uh, Complexo do Alemão and Rocinha several times before. And the, the results were never uh, uh, truly uh, understood and never truly assessed by the government. Uh, or by uh, specialists in, in general, you know. Okay. So just to give you a, a data, uh, one grassroots uh, organization, local organization of Maré, uh, one of the main uh, favelas, complex of favelas in Rio, uh, the Redes da Maré, uh, the organization, they conducted a survey with uh, favela dwellers in 2015 when the military occupied uh, the, the favela. Uh, and they asked them about the, their views on the occupation. More than 75% of the people didn't think that it was good for them. 70% uh, okay. of people didn't think that uh, they were safer after the occupation. So we first need to uh, assess what okay. has been done in the past you know, to then uh, do something much more precise and okay. much more effective now. So according to the studies then that, that Eric is, is citing, people who were living in fear do not feel safer because of this military intervention. In fact, they feel less safe. But please explain, if this is indeed true, why would there be a military intervention in the state of Rio when it is not the most dangerous or violent area in the country. There are apparently a 10 more areas that are in more need of intervention than Rio. Uh, let me first dwell with one issue which I think is very important. Uh, the federal intervention is fully constitutional. There That's are fine. articles, there are uh, we, provisions we we in the Constitution. We haven't debated that. They're yeah. just asking why, whether it's constitutional yeah. or not, as but beside. The, 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 but Mrs. Jurema has uh, said that it was debated. And I think that it, we have to stress this fact. It's very constitutional. And there are many people that are supporting this initiative. The fact is that, uh, in general, people are in need of feeling more safe in safer in Rio. Uh, there are many uh, different organisms, there are different NGOs that have supported this federal intervention because it has reached a point in terms of lack of security that honest citizens do not feel safe. They do not feel safe to go to their jobs, uh, children to go to school. There have been killings of stray bullets that have happened in Rio. And you ask me why Rio and why not uh, tackling other states. The fact is that Rio is the window of Brazil. When it's the Rio, highest profile. It, Rio is very important. Mm -hmm. Rio is a powerhouse in terms of culture. Uh, Rio is a powerhouse in terms even economically and in the production of creative knowledge in Brazil. So I think that the fear that we have, have and I think it's a fear that many Brazilians sh share, is the fact that uh, this uh, plague is spreading up. Okay. The president referred to it as a metastasis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going from here and it's spreading up to other states. I think that the initiative uh, has support. Uh, the uh, army will work together with the police uh, in okay. dealing yeah, with I security.
Before so, we go much further, I, I just wanted to get Eric's response yeah. to this. I mean, Eric, is that justification enough for making Rio a priority in this fight? Um, yeah. Well, I think this discourse uh, tells a lot about uh, what's going on, because it's all about image, it's all about media, because if Rio is not even close to being the most violent state in, in Brazil, and if it's just because it's seen as the powerhouse, as the cultural hub of Brazil, uh, so it means that it's a matter of image. It's a matter of how people inside and outside Brazil uh, see Brazil. So, uh, and so this is the proof that we have a lot of issues to, to deal with. Uh, right. so, and I think I think this is related also to the political situation, the current polit political situation, because President Temer has broken uh, the the lowest record of approval ratings ever, at least since uh, the end of the di dictatorship. Uh, he's got to the lowest point of three percent of uh, people uh, approving his government, and uh, he's been trying to pass several uh, unpopular laws. And, uh, and he knows that. And it got to a point that he needed some uh, fresh uh, support from the population. And okay. he knows that security is one of the key issues. That's why he's doing this intervention. He's doing this intervention to try to get his approval ratings up somehow. Uh, okay. was trying to pass all the unpopular demand uh, laws Let that me let uh, the ambassador respond to that. Is, I mean, is, is Temer just trying to look tough on crime to boost his ratings? Of course not. No. The president is very worried, as all Brazilian citizens, about the situation. I see. He has honestly yeah. uh, been very courageous and very determined to initiate this operation, this intervention. I, and I think that it's not think... just a question of image. It's a question of uh, the second most important city, the second most important state in Brazil, economically, uh, in terms of culture, as I mentioned. So it's very important. The fact that there are other states, other cities that have similar pro problems is something that can be tackled later on. But Rio is, at this point, strategic. Okay, Jurema, do you accept that Rio should be a priority? And realistically, then, what can be done if not sending in the military? Actually, they, uh, here in Rio, they are applying for military inter uh, actions since 2008. And what and Amnesty International has documented it and reported on that. And we, what we saw is that increased the vi human rights violation in the, in, inside the community, especially in, inside the favelas. Yes, Rio can be a priority, but for us, human rights can be a pr priority not only the human rights of people in Rio, but from, of people from all country. I mean, uh, we have the right of public security. We have the right to see and know an uh, uh, effective plan of, on public security as well as other public policies. But what, what we are seeing is not that. There's no plan. There's, they are always bringing the... the the military to say to, to present what what they they are presenting they are presenting nothing what we we can see is that the government launched something that they know exactly what it is uh, they announced something that is nothing uh, okay. they had after the, the the this intervention they had the tools they had the tools to do to do the things to do public security to do public policies but they are not they were not using it and why they are applying for this right now we don't understand we need an answer right now because the people in rio as as the same the people in other states they need an answer about uh, effectiveness of public security and we need to change the the, the premise we need to change the, to change the idea of war. They are bringing the army. We are not in, in war. We, don't, we need to change the idea of war on drugs. We need to put their prevention. We need to put their public policy to, to, to develop the, the condition of living of the people okay. there. We don't need more guns. It, we, we already know more guns means more death. We don't want this. OK, Ambassador, I'll let you respond, quick, if you can. Yeah, uh, I think that we have to uh, look into the question of human rights broadly uh -huh. and in a balanced way. What's happening now in Rio is a violation of human rights of the United citizen. That's what's happening. You know, people are not safe to go out in the streets. We have been seen scenes of tourists being beaten in the streets. 
This is something that has to be coped with. And this is something that the army, in this intervention, together with the police, with, together with the instruments of public security, is going to deal with. Of course, we have to do much more than that. This is the first stage, and this is an action that, as the president determined, is an action extreme. And it's in the short run, this is what uh, has to be done and was asked even by state authorities. But then we have to invest much more. We have to invest in intelligence. Mm -hmm. We have to invest in education. This is a very important aspect that has to be dealt with. Okay. Unfortunately, authorities of the states of the state have not done enough, you know, to cope with these different areas, social areas that need to be tackled in order that violence be uh, uh, okay. finished, ended. Eric, I mean, I, I, you've explained yes, well your I cynicism. Wanted, uh, okay, Jurem, go ahead. No, I just wanted to to add that yes, the state's authorities had the. Job the the responsibility to invest in public security and also in other public policy. But the federal government did the same responsibility, and they never presented something coherent. Coherent. They never presented anything that if effectively uh, changed the, the, the living condition of the people. I agree that violence is against the human rights, but I agree also that we cannot sacrifice more human rights and uh, justifying that we are doing something to pre prevent or to protect the human rights. This uh, federal intervention is against, uh, 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 is worrisome because they can uh, attack more human rights. We can uh, pre uh, create a, a, a better, uh, uh, okay. a, uh, we can create a situation to, to, to down deeper the human rights of the people when we cannot upset that, accept it. Okay. I mean, Eric, I'm going to give you a final word then because, unfortunately, we're running out of time. But, I mean, at the core of what you're saying is basically your cynicism, uh, re the motives of the government here for intervening in this way, particularly in Rio. For you, it's about protecting an image and protecting the wealth of people in the, in the city. And if that is the only inter then how do you keep people in the favelas in Rio safe? Well, this is definitely not about keeping the favelas uh, safe. I mean, the people in favelas safe. Uh, this is something uh, for middle class audience uh, who feels that they are going to be safer uh, because the army is in the favelas. But actually, again, as I said, and as Jurema said, it happened lots of time before. At the end of the day, uh, the ones who are suffering are the ones who live in the favelas, who are being targeted by stop and search operations that are completely absurd. People are being photographed, people are being pictured by uh, uh, by the army uh, staff okay. uh, when they, when they come and go to the favela okay. and, uh, uh, with their IDs. So this is ridiculous. They don't do that in in the wealthier parts of the city. So this okay. is not just a human rights violation, but this is absolutely. Absurd and ineffective. Eric, I will, it I will, won't get any bigger results. I will have to give you the last word. Unfortunately, we're actually over time uh, for this segment. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists so much for joining us on this edition of the Newsmakers. What we ask is for the bill to be passed at the soonest possible time. This way, we can give our moral brothers enough time to prepare, thus enabling them to nurture the seeds of meaningful governance which were planted for the Bangsa Moro. Last year, the Philippines faced one of its worst battles in recent years as government forces faced off against Daesh in Marawi. The conflict went on for months and more than a thousand people were killed. Now, some are warning the conditions are ripe for it to happen again, including the leader of the country's main rebel group. The Moro Islamic Liberation Front was once a staunch enemy of the government, but after decades of fighting, they reached a peace deal. The Moro rebels would lay down their weapons, and in return, the Muslim majority in Mindanao was promised autonomy under the Bangsamoro Basic Law. That autonomy hasn't yet been delivered, and President Rodrigo Duterte has warned another war could break out if the legislation collapses. 
The Philippine Congress has promised to fast-track the bill for Muslim self-rule in the southern island, but could it possibly lead to unintended consequences? Well, for more, let's speak to Malcolm Cook. He's a senior fellow at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore. Malcolm, thanks so much for joining us. It almost seems counterintuitive, as many would assume, that a president like Duterte would want to assume actually more power in a region with a separatist movement like this, but he doesn't. Why do they believe so strongly that autonomy is the answer? I guess the Moro insurgency groups, including the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, which is now the biggest one, I guess for the last 40 years at least have been negotiating with the Philippine government for some variation of an autonomy, autonomous region within Muslim Mindanao, a, the Muslim majority part of the second largest island of the Philippines. And President Duterte is the first president ever in the Philippines from Mindanao. So there are great hopes in Muslim Mindanao that President Duterte could finally deliver a final peace agreement, including this Bangsamoro basic law that uh, his predecessors uh, since President Marcos, as I say, four decades ago, ha have failed to do. But so far, for the first year and a half of the Duterte administration, there has been almost no progress on that front. Describe, if you can, how an autonomous state in Mindanao would look with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front at the helm. Would we see a, a democracy develop in the way that we in the West would define it? There's already an existing autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao, but it hasn't delivered what people hope. So it's an autonomous uh, government under the Philippine state that has held elections uh, since the early 2000s. And that was part of a peace agreement struck between the Manila government and another large uh, Moro insurgency group. So the Banksa Moro basic law is to enhance the existing and largely failed autonomous region that already exists and probably shift uh, the political power for that region uh, to the Moro Islamic Liberation Front who negotiated the current peace agreement with the preceding government, the Kino government. So there's already an autonomous region there that's under Philippine law, but it hasn't delivered uh, peace to the region. There are hopes that this new peace deal with the MILF could finally deliver peace, but as I say, it seems stalled and uh, its prospects are not as good as they looked even a year ago. Okay, well, knowing the region as well as you do, is this the best way forward, in your opinion? It's certainly the best way forward, but the problem is there are many Moro's, Moro insurgency groups, some large ones that are negotiating for peace but there's more than one, but there are a growing number of smaller terrorist groups like the ones that uh, led the siege of Marawi that are increasingly popular among alienated youth and have no interest in negotiating for peace with the Philippine government. So even if this peace agreement is finally put into legislation, something that's been four years in the making, these terrorist groups that became uh, famous worldwide with the Marawi siege uh, will still probably be there and will probably try to uh, disrupt any movement towards a political solution. So, so a peace agreement with the legislation uh, to put it into practice is needed, but not uh, it's not going to solve everything. Okay, but by giving this autonomy to the region, does it take the responsibility off the government's hands, in a sense? Uh, certainly under the agreement signed and the draft bill, for example, the police force for the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao will come under the autonomous government. Um, and many other areas like uh, control of natural resources will be more in the hands of this autonomous government. So this new autonomous government, if it is created, will have more powers, including police powers, and hence should be more responsible for law and order in that area. Okay. But as I say, we're pretty far away from that, particularly because President Duterte also wants to introduce federalism, which could 
override all of this anyway. I, I was just about to ask about that. I mean, what about the larger system of governance in the Philippines? Duterte does want federalism, a devolved government. Will he get it? And would it work? Uh, it's probably the best chance there's been discussions, especially for groups outside Metro Manila, for decades that the Philippines, a very diverse archipelagic state, would be better under federalism. But earlier attempts have failed to get constitutional ref revisions that are necessary. President Duterte is very committed and has very large majorities in the two houses of parliament. So if federalism is going to happen in the Philippines, it'll happen now. Whether it'll work or not, I'm very doubtful, because the Philippines has so many different linguistic groups, over 60 or 70, and the federal system they're talking about is only creating five provinces. So the provinces won't match the linguistic and ethnic diversity of the Philippines, but will probably just create another level of government, and the Philippines already has too many politicians. So okay. I think federalism, which Duterte has long seen as the solution, Again, I'm not sure it will actually make the situation better. Okay, Malcolm Cook, joining us there from Singapore. Thanks so much for that. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Andrea Sankey. You can check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. Next time, was a Czech court justified in releasing former PYD leader Saleh Muslim? We look at why the ruling has enraged Turkish officials. Until then, thanks for watching. Goodbye.